Tiko mkele kwa mbatu wika malamu ni nguzo walino kakwa na mshanje siku University of the Western Cape. Na lapo kukona e, ingo kwa eze zaote zikube kutibene oso mashishini o profesa o kreha. Uka ndike naba patiso wa sebu kulmendin. Kuzo kusalu uchwa kujongwa indela zokuba kungenzu anjanina uze kujikwe imeko, iputulu imeko yezo kukosho, kuchinjwa imeko ya bandwa mashupe kayo. Nogu vala isike uso kunga lingani. Um. Without any further ado, then I will call up um, the panelists. Um, their portfolios have already been introduced. So I'll just call your name and then please take a seat at our at our round table. Mr. Daniel Kinnear. Mr. Kinnear will moderate the discussions um, this afternoon. Minister Trevor Manuel. Ms. Joan Fubbs, Mr. Roland van der Geer, I'm hoping Ms. Gloria Serobe is here, yes she is, <laughs> Professor Julian May, And last but not least, Professor Ben Cousins. Vice Chancellor, thank you for, on behalf of the panel and many guests that are here today, to thank you for the vision and pioneering of this round table. We hope we do justice to the genesis of a long journey to help in the, our attempt to resolve what uh, Professor now said as the history of poverty and inequality, that it is not the next round table that could look to those issues. Those issues are symptomatic of our society uh, and its history. And uh, I'm certain with this able panel today, uh, we'll begin to, begin to fathom the origins and the solutions and the possibilities of this institution which you had to try and provide the answers to sometimes the complex, conflicted solutions. Uh, prior to coming down here, um, Minister Manuel said, uh, when talking about the National Development Plan, good luck if we're trying to look and understand it, and more than anything else, get it to serve as a compass as we navigate our way from a history that where sits where it is, but with, on which accompanies us on our shoulders as we go forward. We'll ask, uh, uh, probably, and it's an easy target, uh, Minister Manuel, to give us a sense of uh, his understanding of uh, the thesis that you presented on the evolution that has got us here and that probably provides us with this journey for us to, to advance this conversation. Thank you very much and uh, we'll try as much as possible to have this uh, gathering to be as interactive, which is the requests and uh, mission of this university and of the faculty that has championed it. Thank you very much. And I, I think without asking deliberately, but uh, maybe, Minister Manny, if you could give us a sense of uh, where our, the National Development Plan sits in trying to provide that journey, that compass to that journey. Okay. And actually, um, my, my submission, Julian, is that unless we intervene, in closing the big gaps in education, we are producing successive generations of people who will battle to find employment. And this is not a money problem. It's attitudinal. I mean, in Makasa, in, in Kailicha, a place that the Archbishop visits frequently uh, as part of his social justice network, an NGO is working in teaching maths and science, and they had a 92% pass rate in mathematics at the high school there last year. So you don't need to be at a, leafy, at a school in a leafy suburb, uh, a sub, nor do you need to have parents with, with, with 
lots of money to pay fees, you need to reconstruct the environment to create the opportunities because our big problem right now is that the marginal returns on education appear to be so low that demotivation sets in. And I think that we've got to start there if we don't want to produce a, another generation of people who are unemployable and therefore produced in poverty. Um, in respect of um, um, what Ben's saying, I think the one million jobs is, a, is, a, is of course a stretch. But it's worthwhile having a stretch target. I'm happy to have a debate on the trade-offs on, on water utilization. We are a water-scarce country, and I think we must have a discussion about it. I don't think that... We're also exceedingly spoilt. Uh, a, we are under-invested in research in water. There's a lot more research in, in renewable energy. We aren't looking at how we will manage a water resource into the future, and that, I think, is fundamentally important. Your story of what's happening in Singa tells us that with adequate support, and it isn't very expensive support, we should be able to transform agriculture differently. There are too many parts of agriculture in South Africa where people have been restituted uh, uh, onto land uh, and are impoverished as a consequence of that act of restitution because there's no support for wherewithal to, to actually farm. They farm from markets, frequently land is marginal. We must have discussions, and that's what I think Chapter 6 begins to open up. We, we are looking at whether we can begin to change this in a place like Mpumalanga. One of the tragedies of land reform, and uh, you'll probably confirm this, is that the major beneficiaries of land reform are actually some of the white farmers who had access to large lands were paid out many hundreds of millions of rand, have bought farms in other parts of the country or have taken some of the money and are farming in neighboring states. And so the beneficiaries of land reform are actually not the target groups of land reform. There's land ownership, but land ownership does not mean uh, improving the quality of life of those who benefit from land reform. These are very important discussions we must have so that we don't knee-jerk into the idea that all that you need is to transfer a title deed and suddenly life improves for people. I think, I think uh, similarly, uh, just to respond to, to Gloria's point, of course we are, we are duty-bound to to deal with Clause 9 of the Bill of Rights, which deals with the equality provisions in our Constitution and allows the state to take measures, legislative measures, to deal with individuals or groups who were previously disadvantaged. There is, there is an imperative to do that. But I think we would be incorrect in our, in our practice if we don't review this from time to time to understand the beneficiaries, to understand the problems being encountered to ask how we can broaden the ownership base and to do detailed analysis of what the true impediments are. Because if it's all about equity provision in large former companies, I mean formerly large white-owned companies, if it's about the equity provision, uh, my, my submission would be that we need to have very firm debates about these issues and be tough on ourselves to ensure that we can broaden the base and be more inclusive in the outcomes of education, uh, of uh, economic policy. Thanks. Uh, with me, I've got the minister in the presidency, uh, Minister Trevor Manuel. Minister, a uh, question to you is that about the forum today, is that 20 years on into our democracy, um, obviously there are gains that have been made, uh, but uh, poverty, inequality, and unemployment still persist. How does the plan of your uh, department uh, work around that? Look, what's very important is that we can inspire people to act. The plan speaks of active citizenship. It talks of leadership, not of one person, but of all South Africans, and it talks of giving voice to our people. That's fundamentally important. In respect of the issues under discussion, the stimulation of small and medium enterprises, we've got to do a lot more to create support systems, but we can't create entrepreneurs. This must come from the desire of people. We're seeing all over Africa the strength of, 
of small and medium enterprises, the determination with which people start them and carry through, the sense that they have that um, government is sometimes in the way. Now, uh, Dr. Richard Maponia, the old doyen of uh, uh, black business, has actually said that he thinks that uh, uh, so much BEE and so much handout from government has actually numbed the spirit of enterprise. I think that uh, uh, Mr. Maponia may have a point about this. We've got to look uh, and, and understand that there are limitations to what government can do. We've got to encourage our people to take action. You can go around townships everywhere. People are unhappy. They're unhappy about who runs the shops in the townships and so on and so on. But nobody has taken it away from them. People uh, express an interest and a spirit of enterprise, and that's why they're trading uh, in townships everywhere. We must encourage this of South Africans too. Now, what can be done exactly to do that? Because that is what is needed. We need strong voice of uh, small and medium businesses. I'm not talking about xenophobic voice. I'm talking about strong voice that analyzes the situation, that makes input into policy, that ensures that it's heard, and that encourages its members. You know, 20 years ago, we were talking about NAFCOC establishing a cash and carry business to support uh, its members so that it didn't have to buy from the large uh, uh, cash and carry uh, wholesalers. We know that some of the foreign nationals operating in South Africa uh, are supported by cash and carry. We've, sp we've spurned all those opportunities ourselves. We've got to understand that unless those support systems are created also as business opportunities, we will sell our people down the drain. Can you get a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a and I just would like to say that we have at the moment with South Africa uh, 22 dialogues running on macroeconomic policy, on health, on rural development, uh, on, on the maritime sector. We're in a, a dialogue with the South African government. Uh, we have a fairly open agenda, but, but where we say, well, look, this is, this is how it happened in Europe. You are doing that now. This is how, how we look at this. Um, what, of course, is at the moment uh, a concern in Europe, and some of uh, my uh, South African um, colleagues have also referred to that, do we keep South Africa internationally competitive as a an, uh, trade and investment destination? Because the world, um, and certainly Europe, we, we have a great interest in seeing this absolute stunning experiment of democracy now also working out economically in a right way because that's not only good for South Africa it's good for the continent but it also sh would show the world you know it's very easy to be pessimistic but look at South Africa so I think we we also attach a huge political commitment to to South Africa's ongoing evolution and we think it is extremely important that um, the conditions, uh, people have referred to that also, the conditions uh, for uh, investment and not only foreign investment because South Africa is a relatively internationally, a, valid, a relatively low receiver of FDI, of foreign direct investment. But there is an enormous amount of money available in this country. But, but I, you know, I see it as part of my job to also convince European investors to, to, to invest in South Africa in a sustainable way. But to keep the conditions for investment uh, and for trade uh, positive, because if there is one thing we've learned in Europe is that trade is extremely important. Uh, for the reduction uh, of, of, of poverty. And I've listened with great interest to what Professor May said on the production of poverty, because I think that's what we're doing in Europe at the moment as well. We are, in some countries, we are producing poverty. We know it, and it's very hard um, to, um, to, to, to address that, although we are trying that. So to round off maybe and, and, and to summarize, um, in the first place, um, Europe feels very committed uh, to assist South Africa in this experiment, and we do that by a large number of dialogues, by an incredibly intense 
relationship with South Africa at, at the presidential level, the ministerial level, between civil societies, between, um, between uh, companies. Currently, still 88% of South Africa's foreign direct investment uh, originates from the European Union. Uh, if, if I had a shop and I had one customer which would do 88%, it would make me nervous. But the figure, the figure has to be, as always in international economics, it's, 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 it's not as simple as that because there, there are other streams there as well. But that means that also Europe's economic interest in the country is there. But it is more of a political interest. It's more of a concern of... Um, having South Africa also as a partner on the continent, because there is more to say, but I will stop it. Let me just say this. Of course, we have seen over the coming years um, our neighbors, North Africa, uh, slipping into a very difficult situation. I mean, uh, Libya, Egypt uh, are actually are neighbors of the European Union. Uh, they are African countries, of course, they are on the African continent, but they're also part of the Mediterranean group to which many countries of the European Union uh, consist. So we've seen, we, we see at the moment that although there are these huge growth expectations of the continent, and, and I think that is partly justified. I worked the past four years in the Great Lakes region. Uh, but we also still see uh, a lot of political instability and economic instability. So the way in which South Africa will continue uh, with this, let, let me call it experiment, is extremely important for the continent and also for the European Union. There is more to say, but let me stop here. Thank you very much. And before I open the... Uh Good evening, sir, and welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much. Tell me, um, your, your visit to South Africa and being part of this delegation, what is the objective? Um, we are here uh, really to celebrate today the the. the, the the launch of the of, of, of the round table. I'm I myself based in Pretoria, and um, we've come here to um, really pay tribute to the activities of the University of Western Cape in um, stimulating economic growth. And we focus today, as you have seen, on small and medium scale enterprises, which we think are absolutely essential for the further evolution of South Africa's economy. In your experience, what can be done to assist these small and medium enterprises to flourish and, and also uh, create more jobs? Well, it, it, I would say it is a combination of um, creating an environment in which they can flourish legally, financially, um, uh, economically, um, by um, implementing, by, by, by formulating and implementing the right laws. So I think that whole legal and financial framework is important, and obviously there the government has a role to play. But it is also a matter of skills, of mentality, of uh, engagement, and that is where uh, the entrepreneurs themselves have their role to play. So it is a matter of marrying the right climate uh, with the right skills and the right mentality. And uh, if that can be achieved, which cannot be done overnight, I mean, also in Europe, in many countries, we are still struggling with a climate that is conducive to small-scale enterprises. Uh, but if that is done, of course, then gradually a, 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 a positive process of growth can emerge. All right. And... Um as you have alluded to, other countries are still struggling with the concept as well. Um, but perhaps maybe we're sitting with the, uh, if not the highest in the world, unemployment rate. And that we need to deal with because if not, then we're sitting on a time bomb. Yeah, there, I think there are two things. As, as you right to say, uh, unemployment in this country is very high. Poverty is still widespread and there is, as we all know, still a high inequality. Some people even say that South Africa's inequality is, is amongst the top of the world, as expressed in this Gini coefficient. Um, at the same time, and you alluded to that as well, we don't have in South Africa a tradition of small-scale enterprises. And yet, small-scale enterprises can play a huge role in um, 
taking off economically, small groups of people, um, families, um, business associates. So I think if we take the, the, the situation in South Africa as it stands now, and if we look at the need for jobs, 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 then it seems uh, from our perspective, from, from the European Union's perspective, that investing in small-scale enterprises is, 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 is a good policy. I also would like to say that um, many of the European firms that are active in South Africa, in fact themselves, are small, medium um, enterprises. So it also shows that small and medium enterprises can invest far out of their own countries, and European firms are here assisting in the creation of, of employment, which I think everybody agrees is the most important in South Africa. But I would like to point out that there are also these small European firms here in South Africa, which I think is fascinating. Mr. Valkir, thank you very much for your time. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to go to the European Union. I'm going to go to the European Union. I'm going to go to the Which I haven't done before. Um, I think the, it's important for us as a BE players to take the criticism and the questions for what they are, because we are part of the experiment. And so um, there is expectation from us as BE players to do certain things, and I'm not struggling with that. Uh, we shouldn't be defensive about it. Firstly, the business, the, 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 the trust relationship between business and government leaves a lot to be desired generally. And somewhere there, I think the BE players, because we are facilitated business people, unlike the traditional business, we have a role to kill this lack of trust in this relationship by just doing a whole lot of things. Because we come from these areas which need to be fixed, we need to change the conversations in the boardrooms. It cannot be business as usual. And it's not a difficult thing to do. The example sitting in a bank bank board, um, I have to make sure that I understand what's happening in the credit committees, for example, yeah. in the bank board, because it's a very complex process. I have to go in there and learn, but I need to immediately decode it back to what is this that we're trying to solve for example, in these uh, rural areas. And so one of the examples uh, that comes out very starkly in that uh, exercise is that the people in the rural areas are not that much poor. The main thing is that their assets are not recognized. Mm. And so a teacher who retires from Cape Town with a 500,000 range retirement and goes back home to Transkei and converts that into livestock. Tomorrow, he is described as poor. Now, the banking models and all those things have got to recognize that livestock as a balance sheet item. It's just an example that says that because that is not business as usual. Traditionally, that is not the case. Anyway, it is the case because in Malmesbury, the livestock is recognized. In Lusikisiki, the livestock is not recognized. Those are the distortions that we are expected because we understand these two worlds and we have the privilege of sitting in these platforms and make sense out of this. Um, land. Land, of course, is an issue, but again, there is a lot of arable land which is communal. There's nothing complicated about using this land. And we are sitting here, we're talking about irrigation, for example, as we behold, we have planted 500 hectares of land in Eastern Cape as we speak. We're not waiting for drought. Why is that? And we don't have irrigation. But why is that? The land is next to the coast. The big farmers do know that. And so the trust relationship 
comes in again in terms of instead of them solving some of these things by using what is there already as a solution, there's a whole lot of complicated conversation about land reform and restitution and whatnot. There is land in the coast and it's not being used. It can be used, it's cheaper, it produces. We are three months with the maize crops and it seems like in the Eastern Cape, we're the only ones who have planted. It's three months now and people are waiting for draft to stop. But that is not true, that's because the professionals in that space, they are not dealing with these distortions that come with the previous apartheid system. We have to reform somewhere in Elliot or Berkeley East and so and stuff like that. No. And I think the, 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 the last point I wanted to say around the land is, as we poll, because our mandate is women, even the giving of the land, even in that communal space, we have to make sure that women are not given just land to build a rendezvous. They are also given land to plant. That is their wealth. And so when we go back to the banks and say, with or without the tenure system, can we be creative about this and recognize these as assets? And I think the whole balance sheet of these rural areas might change a little bit. Minister, maybe you can, you can comment on this because I know that we're struggling with the rural existence and all that kind of thing. Yeah, there's poverty, we have to deal with it, but there are things which, as we speak, can be fixed. And those things are not fixed because we are still sitting on the distorted space. And so the farmers are sitting in free state when they should go to Lusikisiga and plow. That is, that is a, and so if there is any criticism as BE players, I should accept is the fact that we have to give time mm. to decode these problems because we have the privilege, facilitated privilege, of being able to know both worlds. That is a criticism one should accept. Thank you. O candidato que me chamou para dizer que o CCO Gloria se roube não o chefe person não o escalão que pambeu o whip hold LTD mesmo mande com a mulher. Encos. Quando caso é, iba no que ganha ganhar em minha nam change na discussion e round table. How important is that? Se a funega se não acolhido, caloco que alunga isso angoco. In the sense that in the bay economy, I know you banta batile and not a banya banta batile. So the panel eh, was so well put together. People of different backgrounds, different views. I must say I enjoyed it because eh, it's that kind of dialogue that we like. But most important though is that eh, it shouldn't just be a talking panel. It must be the doing panel. So what I enjoyed most about the panel is that the people, it's the people who are doing things wherever they are sitting, they are trying to do their best wherever. As if you can learn, you can learn to 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 learn I think the reality is that uh, e conversations we boardrooms have got to change, they have got to build that into it. Uh, if we are going to be creative about how do we uh, build uh, small businesses because we think that they will help with employment, I think the big businesses must come on board and also look at that uh, innovatively uh, and do what has got to do. Um, one of the things, for example, always say access to finance, that is the most talked about. Access to markets, some of the markets are the big businesses. Cabbage is cabbage now. Potatoes is potatoes. They don't really have to come from another big farmer to stock up or pick and pay, no spa, no ban ban. I think they can really uh, encourage some of the small businesses as growers and source from them, as an example. 
But as I'm not over Fnagazens, but I look little pressure basing a pine lap business. A Sazamulung Salon de Unali Pupalobango twenty thirty. No cost of a sesquitile, a witch in Chen Lemeco. Here and the government, okay, so and the twenty thirty of Nagami Mondo in denial. Mshambi ndi major shamonga bantu anabam in the sense that I don't want them to go through what I went through, and so I will obsess a lot about the long road I took. It must not be unnecessarily be taken by them as well. Having said that, there is no space for shortcuts. We also have to tell our children that we are Pangel. Uh, it's nothing about to be investing in the government or we billionaires. There is no such as such in the world. I call on to be a banker. You need to spend 10 years, 15 years in the banking system, working tediously and doing these things. So those do not have fund sanas on. In donje, if you See to make sure you're not tin again is that they must never feel excluded again. Then we will have uh, failed them. Mems Robe si bulelga kulung e kashalako. Thank you. Ukenike lobe sin gola nae apo ngu mem usa si robe nongu e uche person we withhold LTD. Usa bugele imba dunde ngu zolno kaiwa unga ina ukuninze si pateleko. The Segu University of the Western Cape Nala Pogu Tibene Kona in a pepe quezo kokosho kambeke besakoka besak kangeli sombluba kungenzu and janina zek bengono kodwa kaus bukele. I think the important thing is to create an environment in which, if one is making legislation or contributing to the development of legislation, one must create an environment in which everyone can contribute. After all, we do have a constitutional people's participatory democracy. How do you enable people to participate? And in so many ways, that phrase, that sentence, typifies the fact that indeed it was developed and crafted in Africa. And when I say by Africans, I mean people who live and who see Africa as their home. Because the concept of working together is very much an Afrocentric concept. It's very much a collective Ubuntu approach to resolving issues. So just as entrepreneurs have to have the courage to overcome challenges, so too, if you are part of, if you like, facilitating the crafting of legislation, whether it is for trade, industry, SMMEs, you need first of all to engage with those who see themselves as entrepreneurs, the practitioners, those who have got their hands dirty, not only the academics, not only the politicians, but those who have that experience and those who have the desire and the passion and the drive to pursue such a career or, if you like, a profession, a direction. Entrepreneurship has got to call for the greatest courage because I say this because courage comes from overcoming failure. 
And as an entrepreneur, you're going to fail most of the time when you first start. You have to have the courage to pick yourself up. So the legislation that we need to develop in that direction needs to come from practitioners, those with the desire, first of all, practitioners, from those who indeed offer the support to the SMMEs, from bankers, from academics, from other businesses in the environment itself, and indeed from those who will purchase their services, their clients, the recipients of the service they provide. So when you have everyone together, you then have an opportunity to develop robust legislation that stands not the test, and I got this from Minister Manuel many years ago when you were Minister of Finance, not the test of one government or one generation, but that stands the test of many generations and may require only tweaking to take it forward into the next environment. Thank you. Thank you. With me, I've got the chairperson um, of the National Assembly Parliamentary Committee, uh, Oversight Committee on Trade and Industry, Ms. Joan Farbs. Ms. Joan, welcome. Thank you very much. Tell us uh, briefly about the work that your committee does. Uh, the Portfolio Committee of Trade and Industry actually does exercise oversight on trade and industry that is conducted by the Department of Trade and Industry. Meaning, what we're looking for is whatever their objectives are, and those objectives are industrialization to create jobs, labor absorbing work, value adding, so that more and more jobs are created and we develop products agro-processing, minerals beneficiation, so that we can trade more competitively. So it causes some sleepless nights for you when instead of creating more jobs, we lose more jobs. Well, it may appear like that. I think there are more people looking for work. And that is, of course, the issue that we have many, many young people coming out of matric in the first place, and we're not creating sufficient new jobs. But also, secondly, as you know, we did have a spell in our country two years back when companies were distressed due to the global economic crisis. And we developed measures to overcome that, but also companies close because of goods coming into the country either illegally or due to the tariffs, they come and compete unreasonably and possibly dump goods uh, just as the chickens were dumped here. <laughs> we, had to, we had to deal with that one. <laughs> no, definitely. Now, um, 20 years into our democracy, um, but we still see inequality unemployment, um, is, is our education system geared for what we want to do? Um, couldn't it be that perhaps with our career guidance we should do more in steering young people towards business as well? Yes, look, it's not quite as simple as that. I do agree with you that at the heart of it is education, but first comes an environment and then education, the identification of the skills that we require, the development of a suitable curriculum, especially at the high school level, and also then at the tertiary in terms of technicons, technical colleges, FET, etc., and developing innovative ways of utilizing or find, finding employment for youths who haven't had that initial direction within the workplace by totally or radically revising our work day. How many hours should you be at the coalface over a machine, over a desk? Perhaps it should be five and three hours spent training 
So I think you've got to look at how we do things in the workplace, how we create jobs with the private sector, and what kind of vehicles we are developing. And that is why small and medium enterprises are so critical, because although they are small, they will provide more employment in our country. Yeah, um, and lastly, ma'am, is that um, one thing is that businesses complain that getting some resources and funding um, is actually a mission that some of them are not even willing to try because it's difficult. Now, briefly, um, how can we undo that? Look, it is financial access is very challenging. But over the last three years in particular, we have developed other avenues to source finance. To date, we have developed something like 43 different incentives specifically to deal with people trying to acquire funds for, to grow their enterprises, to start an enterprise. And we have simplified the regulatory regime, what we call, um, you know, um, what do you call it? a lot of regulations, etc. that you have, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. And thank you for cutting the red tape. Yes, that's what we certainly have done. <laughs> thank you. All right. We can take a look at the role of Apple and the Sisalo Portfolio Committee at Jongene and as a Huebo Parliament. Thank you. Um, one common point of reference in our debates about land reform in South Africa uh, is the experience of our neighbors to the north, Zimbabwe. Uh, some people think that uh, land reform in Zimbabwe is a good example of how not to do things, and others think the opposite. They show the enormous potential. Uh, the truth is somewhere between those two extremes, but there's no doubt that uh, some of the small farmers on the fast-track land reforms are proving very productive. However, the economy as a whole is in dire straits, and we need that wider economic context before an agrarian economy uh, can really take off. In other words, it's not either or, it's and, and. I just want to um, start by noting that Chapter 6 of the National Development Plan on an Inclusive Rural Economy um, sets out a very, very ambitious target. That is to create one million new jobs in agriculture, when we know that commercial agriculture is actually shedding jobs uh, uh, with mechanization and so on. So is it possible f to create a million new jobs in agriculture through land reform and agricultural development? Well, one way that the NDP says uh, we, can, we can do this is to put another 500,000 hectares under irrigation. Um, that's on top of the million and a half hectares we have already. Um, and irrigation, of course, creates intensive agriculture and is, in fact, job intensive. This statement is very controversial amongst the, the water resource experts of our country. And they uh, are of the opinion that it's either not possible or that, in fact, the available water resources should be used for mining industry and domestic purposes. So there's a, one key fact about development in our country is that, in fact, there are always trade-offs to be made. There are difficult choices. Um, if there's enough water to create another 500,000 hectares under irrigation, it will be at the expense of other uses and users of water. Um, but uh, with that as background, let me just give you three or four facts from the area of KwaZulu-Natal that I've been doing research in for the last four years, one of the poorest parts of the country. The people left behind in those homelands, those former Bantustans, the reserves, the people often removed from land elsewhere under the land dispensation of the past. Um, one of the poorest performing municipalities in the country. It's a place called Msinga, and it's a small town called Tugela Ferry. There's an irrigation scheme there, 540 hectares, between 800 and 1,000 farmers. 70% of them are women. These are truly micro-enterprises. The average size of the plot under cultivation is 0.4 of a hectare. Some people cultivate maybe double that. This is a very, very productive scheme. Uh, there's a huge demand for plots. I estimate that uh, the, a the average gross value of production from this scheme is about between 15 and 20 million rand a year. It supports a very thriving, informal, uh, fresh produce market, with bucky traders and hawkers coming to buy produce from the farmers. I estimate that, in fact, each hectare 
sustains about five jobs. That is two farmers per hectare, uh, two workers, and at least one informal trader. The earliest green maize in the province is grown in the scheme and produce is shipped as far afield as Durban, Peter Maritzburg, even as far as uh, afield as Lesotho at times. This is an example of micro-enterprises in deeply disadvantaged rural areas which work. And they do so because they have access to good land, fertile soils, and water. They also have access to a market. The market is key. The, the Bucky Revolution of 20 years ago saw traders arriving saying to the farmers, we want to buy your green maize. It hasn't happened because of government policy. It hasn't happened because of development projects. It's happened because the enabling conditions for entrepreneurs, or if you like, decision makers have been created. Government has played a key role in providing cheap, not to say free, water on a very, very simple gravity-fed irrigation scheme. Right now, government is busy investing 20 million rand in refurbishing the scheme, and hopefully these levels of productivity can increase by 20 to 25 percent and increase these incomes if we do it right. But these levels of productivity, which are actually very impressive, and uh, as a former horticulturalist, I can vouch that the quality of the crops is very good, has been achieved despite the lack of effective extension services. So is there a role for the state? What is the role of the state? Well, it's there to provide the access to the water, but it's also to it should be by providing up-to-date, useful information for farmers. That isn't happening at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, with me, I am with uh, Professor Ben Cousins, um, who is also attending the uh, roundtable discussions. Professor, welcome. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Professor, tell us, um, talk to us about the importance of um, a gathering of this nature that took place now at UWC today, and also uh, especially focusing on the rural uh, um, economic development. Well, uh, Zweli, the, the, there have been policies to promote small and medium enterprises uh, for, as in the cause of, of poverty reduction and employment growth since 1994 but they've had very little impact so far. So clearly there's a problem. And, and, and why is that? Why, why has that happened? I, I think that uh, the question of the real world constraints facing small and medium scale enterprises in South Africa that are poorly understood. And hence the policies are not based on a sound understanding of the realities that they seek to intervene in. And I think this is partly because we have simplistic ideas about complex realities. So the value of a gathering such as we've had today is to put a whole lot of different perspectives together to try and get a rounded view of a very complex problem. That's why I like the title, a round table, because this is a multifaceted problem and we have to look at it from many angles simultaneously. And if any of us still harbor the illusion that there are simple answers, then we're on the wrong track. Uh, now let's, uh, Professor, let's come to the practicality of it, because at the end of the day, um, out of these discussions, something needs to be done to change the way we do business, because we cannot continue as if things are normal when they are not. What can be done? Well, you've come, we're sitting here at a university, and universities are places where ideas are generated and communicated. And I'd like to say something about practicality. In my view, there's nothing so practical as a good idea. And there's nothing so impractical as a bad idea. And so the first place we have to start is with our thinking. We have to jack up our thinking, good ideas, and ones which embrace complexity. And I'd like to give a very practical example of what I mean from the rural context where I do most of my research. It seems to me that what we that the, the dominant idea about, for example, small-scale farmers in South Africa is that they must be integrated into high-value, formal value chains. They must be encouraged to supply pick-and-pay and Woolworths and checkers and so on. And they, there are a great many programs aiming to integrate small-scale farmers into these formal value chains. Actually, they're on the wrong track. Yes, that will benefit some people, a small minority of small-scale farmers, either on land reform farms or in the former homelands or whatever. But actually, the vast majority of small-scale farmers in this country are likely to, be to benefit from interventions in the informal value chains, of which we know very little. 
We know that they're there, we know that they're large, but we know very little about their real functioning, their real constraints, and how policies can address those issues. We started with the wrong idea. And once we start with a better idea, which is that there are these big informal value chains out there with bucky traders and hawkers and spaza shops procuring produce from small-scale farmers and selling without the high-quality standards demanded by the supermarkets, once we start with that idea, I think we'll have, have a, a, a much better and more practical set of policy interventions that we can launch. Professor, thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for sharing some insights into the topic. It's a pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to talk to Professor Ben Cousins. I'm going to talk to you about your farm. I'm going to talk to you about your farm. I'm going to talk to you about The university has as its mission to be a place of quality, a place to grow from hope to action through knowledge. And so today we have tried in a small way to demonstrate that. But my hope and longing as a South African is for the panelists who have spoken today to go out of this place and say, what is the one thing that is tangible and practical that I will do within my sphere of influence to enable that which we are talking about to happen in our, in, in our context. And so that is uh, the challenge to you. And if I may conclude with a quotation from chapter seven of the National Development Plan on page 217. Uh, this contextualizes what needs to be done. And I read, we need to achieve measurable outcomes related to food, water, energy, education, health, transport, and communication infrastructure, national defense, adjustment to climate change, and economic growth to benefit all South Africans. I think the scale and the scourge of poverty is just too much for us to fold our hands and to, to despair. We need to do something and South Africa has got people, it has got resources, and it's got knowledge, and I know we can do it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about your name. I'm going to talk to you about your name. I'm going to talk to you about your name. I'm going to talk to you about your name. I'm going to talk to you about your name. I'm going to talk to you about your name. Archbishop, I'm going to talk to you about your name. Kutatuango Liveza umzuzo kwa banye aikubantu bonke. So siti masike si chonke lendo si kokla si bwana kuti ubu shrempu jenge ndawe yoku fundi isa. Na wadu sabishishin ne politician singapu pelisa ganja nubu shrempu. Wow, uteta kakle bishop, uteta njengo mtanjiru. Singapu pelisa nja nike ubu shrempu singa tisana noso mashishini. Siti, fana si chongo kuti, ezi business zase, or obush, ya, ezi business zase lokshi, ezi nini, mazi nga chonge ya lwa panzi, because nazo zi angeta. The time si kula pa, goma sada, wittle si, na magomani, po kukona, ii ndoze irrigation, ii ndawazo ulema. Ngoko, abandu abasanimi, sifuna i granti, sifuna ugungetiso. But in a sitting go, land of Gunetis or Ne Grant, Iba Legile, but is as Bula, is as Sensagalis and Jay, Gessis, Fancy, see, Jong, is into, is in Nati, Cunye, ne political heads, Zetu, Naban Basomashishin, S. Gazenza, S. As Fundis and Atukuti, Sis Yenzelinda, Yemisebez, Utis, Sizazo Gucha. 
Also, my sister, you are not scared of us. But you will find out that you are not alone. Oh, 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 you are not alone. The business up in South Africa. Bake, Bajong, Ezin to Ezi, Science, I read Tabi, Apartheid Era, Uguti, Nogo, Science, Abantabach, and I was on Gena, Kulenda, the Sabushi, Ewe, Abanyabali, Labati, Red Tabi Corner, Abanyabali, Labati, that was a procurement, Zenza, e corruption. But Congo, Kupasi Tatanguti, Zezi, Pizzi, and Dosing as Beka, Apeta Flenza and Zaguti, Avant Bonk was South Africa. About Pumele. Fundis, Bishop Wam, Manbule, the Kakulung at Kashalak. Engos, Engos Kako. Who can get over in Holland? I am go, Archbishop Mahoba, and Jing Bumva, in Nene Kungang and Elela, Ichalike, Noko, Eco in the Alphanek. I said to my uh, ten year old that I was attending. Uh, a gathering of intellects and people that are going to make a difference in our lives. How do you explain to a 10-year-old what a gathering like this will do? How would I go home and know that I've said and I've done what I promised I will do? Much has been said, but I can't thank anybody until we see the fruits. I will not stand here and say thanks on an arbitrary way and expect you to take that from me. We part and we have done yet another in Daba, yet another gathering. So forgive me for taking my jacket off. And as I said to the Your Grace, if I can, thank you, sir. I'll take that hand. And it will take me a little while to roll up my sleeves, but I will do it. I can quote many scholars, many academics. Can I quote one that my, my daughter really likes? He's purple and he's a dinosaur and he's called Barney. And he says sharing is caring. Are we going to sit here and say to ourselves that we don't have an abundance, a God-given right in this country of ours with everything that is at our midst with all the problems that we face? Can we really say that? How do I go home and say to my children, the future is unknown? What would you like me to say? What's really interesting is that if it wasn't for a few ladies, South African ladies or kick-ass ladies, we wouldn't be sitting here. I have seen dedication, I've seen motivation, I've seen sheer poetry. Some of these ladies come in dynamite packages. They slap you in the face, they wake you up five different ways. And yet we fail. Yet the man in the street still goes hungry. Yet we still have the right to sit and deliberate. And I know, you look at it, 50 minutes of deliberation cannot solve the problem of 20 years or 100 years or the continent that we face at this stage. I ask you one thing, collaboration, partnership. I beg you, many people laughed at us. They said it could not be done. There's a person sitting here that should be really speaking to you, and his name is Carl Lotter. The man says what nobody else wants to say. He goes where nobody else wants to go. He insults people that don't want to like to be insulted. But he says what needs to be said. And I learn from that. I take heart from that. We're in it all together. I can go back to this speech that my daughter read and said, I don't understand any of it, Dad. One portion of it goes to 1992 and one fine young lady from Canada addressing the United Nations and saying, why is it that we teach our children to do everything that we do not do ourselves? Do not fight. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not make policy that doesn't work. But we do it ourselves. You do as I say. 
but we don't listen to ourselves. As a father, I stand against everything, and I'm humbled by the honorable role that has been given to me to say thank you to many people that have made this possible. Okay, the Kenyan name upon denial, um, Nomzana Uhere Azima Nongwe, a executive chairperson of African Small Medium Enterprise Federation. Welcome, sir. Thank you. All right, tell me how important was the meeting, uh, the round table discussion today around the economic development? On a scale of one to ten, maybe a hundred. Um, the importance of the round table basically speaks for itself. We need a platform that all aspects of society can collaborate and partner with themselves. Um, I refuse to think that we don't have goodwill in South Africa. I refuse to think that we don't have um, the intellect and the knowledge base. Uh, what's missing is, is more collaborative partnerships that are done on a regular basis. I think what, what you would have picked up from, from today is that most people put their finger on the factor that Although we have great ideas, we don't execute. And execution is the most important thing. At the end of the day, we are responsible to the people on the ground and the people in the streets who don't have. Um, one way of going about that is to give that respect back to them, to say that we do listen and we do include them. The round table epitomizes that. It is exactly that. It says to people, we want you to sit with us. It isn't us talking to you. It isn't about passing legislation. It is about an engaging environment that everybody can come in. And I don't think we could have been in a better environment than UWC because it represents a cross-section of the society. And why don't we execute? We've got such brilliant ideas and people are living in poverty, people are unemployed. Why don't we execute? I think if you had that answer, you would have the silver bullet to sort out all the problems. Um, I'm not really interested in knowing why we don't execute. I am uh, an advocate of wanting to come up with things that are simple enough for people not want to walk away from. Um, if we make things too complicated for ourselves, there is no um, you know, surprise that why we, we don't execute well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think at the end of the day, what is important is that we listen to all sides. And for not for the first time, but for the only time, we make sure that we roll up our sleeves and we do what people are asking us to do. It isn't ours to give. It's there and it's there in abundance. We must work and collaborate better together. So maybe the, another, another way of answering why things don't work is that you have to understand that complexity should not put us off of wanting to do something. Complexity is only a challenge. And we have the intellect to unbundle that. I think at times we look at face value, we don't go deep enough. And again, it would be very uh, silly of me to just give you a one-line one answer because there is much more complex way of looking at it. We can do it, though. I'm, I'm, I'm sure of that. And today was uh, just the beginning. Indeed, sir. And if it's not, I, I will hate myself. I will look myself in the mirror and I hate myself for what not doing what the people of South Africa and the SME community of South Africa are asking. I want us to work together and I want to create that platform. It isn't about egos and it isn't about titles. It's about a selfless partnership that is collaborative towards achieving the same goal. And that's about our children in the future. And if we cannot do that, if we cannot sit around the table and talk about the future of our children and job creation, then I don't know why we're here. Mr. Azima, thank you very much for your time. For having me, I appreciate that. Thank you. Ukani kila ubesi nukola na e, ngu soma shishi ni ovelelayo umnumzano Azima. Beku kanga kwa besi kupatele kona kesi se UWC University of the Western Cape. Na lapo beku kukwa kona ngelela na makaebo na makiza na kwenziwa ukuze kukaso o soma shishi ni ukuze imeko ekutale ni ibe ngono kubando wanga pangilio na abo bazifumana Benga kabina ndo ya kubeka eziko.